Hey, it's Mark Patterson back again with another phenomenal episode of Finding Your Summit. And I don't throw that word around a lot, but this individual is special. His name is Kyle Maynard. And Kyle is a guy who, I'll just set this up. I was on Aconcagua down in Argentina climbing this crazy mountain about 21,000 feet. And all of a sudden I see this guy crawling up the mountain and I didn't know what was coming at me. I'm sitting on a rock taking a breather like, gosh, can I keep going? And he comes literally crawls next to me. And this guy, Kyle, was born with no arms or legs, congenital amputee, it's called. So essentially at the elbow and at the kneecap, that's where it ends. And so he's taken on these amazing challenges. He's been on Oprah. He's got two SBs for Athlete of the Year. He climbed Kilimanjaro. I mean, talk about absolute inspiration. And so we walked through this journey and he's got this whole mantra on life about no excuses, no excuses to go do things. And uh, boy, if we all took that to heart, we'd just be better people right? We wouldn't sit around and complain. I mean, look at the guy next to you. And just an inspiration. And I told him this, you know, as I was looking up his resume and I was doing some research on him, I was like, gosh, I haven't done anything compared to what this guy's done. I mean, he's just constantly forward thinking about possibilities. And that's the thing that inspires me and why this, this episode was so much fun to do. So phenomenal describes him. And as always, please go in and rate and review on iTunes, Finding Your Summit. We just continue to pile up the downloads. People are so, I think, driven to hear about adversity because we all have it, right? And there's nothing special I'm doing. It's just the people are coming on and sharing their stories and we can all identify with these different things. So that is that. So on that note, let's get after this episode and have a chat with Kyle. Here we go. Hey, everybody, it's me, Mark Patterson, back again with another great episode. Actually, this is an epic episode of Finding Your Summit. And if there was some asterisk I was going to put on this one, it would be something like super or amazing or awesomeness. Uh, These are a whole lot of words. And the reason why I say that is because this particular gentleman, Kyle Maynard, is a guy who I literally, and I want to set this up first, Kyle, I was literally sitting at about 21,000 feet on this rock. I was tired. You know, half our group had bailed out. We started with 12 and we were down to six at that point in time. So I'm sitting on this rock and all of a sudden there's this dude like literally crawling up the mountain. This is one of the world's highest mountains, twenty almost 23,000 feet. And this guy comes crawling past me and I'm looking at him and he's like, what's up, dude? <laughs> and and I was just like, well, I, I couldn't even believe what I was seeing. And we had that short conversation. But, you know, again, for people who don't know, you were born without any arms and legs. I'm not sure if I'm describing that correctly and we'll get into that. And you've just had this amazing journey of accomplishment. You know, I was doing all my research on you and I mean, I haven't done jack compared to what you've done. Seriously. And so I'm just so inspired and so grateful that you came on the show. I know I'm a little bit long-winded on this, but it's it's such a gift for me that you decided to come and and talk to us. So anyway, Kyle, welcome to the show. Thanks, brother. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, I was definitely having some flashbacks of sitting on that rock, you know, when you were describing it. It It's pretty wild. Yeah. So let's just set up first what your condition is. So people, you know, visually, you and I are looking at each other yep. right now. I saw you in Argentina and now I'm, I'm staring at you right now on Skype, you know, video. But for the listener that's out there, why don't we just quickly paint the picture visually of kind of the way you were born and then we'll, we'll get into this literally laundry list of accomplishment that you've been able to do. Yeah. So just to give people kind of a visual idea, basically my arms and right at the elbow and my legs and at the knee. And it's been that way since I was born. So never really known any other way. And, you know, I think in many regards, it makes it significantly easier having only known that way. So, you know, kind of mom and dad didn't really know I was going to be born with a disability. That ultrasound technology was a lot different. But I think they just made that critical decision early on that they were going to focus on trying to treat me as normal as possible. You know, not focus on just the disability or everything that went wrong with it. So... All right. This is just amazing stuff. So I was in my research, I was doing, I was looking at a lot of videos because you've had a lot of content, right? You've got a special story and a lot of the things, this whole mindset about not no excuses and seem like your father was more the driver of like, you know what? 
my kid's got this situation, but you know, I'm not going to give him the way out and he's going to be like everybody else. And you're always treated in that way and your family and your friends, right? Yeah, definitely. I think there was a good balance between both my, my mom and dad and you know, my dad's instincts were definitely to be more of the force for like independence, you know, kind of forcing me to try to figure out how to go and do things on my own and not really have to be reliant on massive adaptations or prosthetics, things like that. My mom, you know, she wanted it to be kind of an easier path. And so I think it was kind of a good balance between the two worlds there. Yeah. Well, no matter who you are, it takes a village, right? And you certainly, it sounds like your dad was a little bit more on the tough love, you know, part of it. But, you know, again, love was anchored that relationship and your mom, of course, she like any mother, just very nurturing and, you know, wanting the best for her kids. So I was looking at these videos and I'm not sure where this started exactly, but it, it sounded like, you know, and I saw some of these videos of you when you're a little kid, you know, running around, you know, and just, you know, you're doing everything else everybody else was doing, you know, with crayons. And then I saw you, I don't know how young you were, maybe look like seven or eight and you had your football uniform on and you're out there literally playing nose tackle, right? For some little league team. Yep. Yeah. Athletically, that's kind of where it all started was just bringing a flyer home from school and tell my mom that I wanted to play, you know, and convincing her. I knew my dad would be the easier one to convince. He was kind of more of like the dreamer too. My mom was a little bit more pragmatic. It was interesting kind of to think about their different personality types and how that kind of played a factor. But yeah, basically just convinced my mom to call the football coach and just see what he said and came out to the tryouts and, you know, ran the bear crawl sprint as fast as I could. You know, when I was at home, I just run around down on all four. So it's kind of exactly what I did the football field and just jumped on my chair and ran it with the other kids and chose eight to number eight to wear in my jersey because I figured it was a good quarterback number and I figured after my performance at the tryouts they were definitely going to make me the quarterback so yeah that was some amazing times you know really the, the cool thing there too I think the coaching staff that I had in particular our head coach for the youth league Tom Shy, you know he had to do something that the more I think about it is pretty remarkable in the fact that he had to basically lobby votes for me to be able to play and be able to participate, you know, and, and it was against a seven member board and convinced four people that I should have the chance to be able to do it. When at that time, you know, short of like a couple of practices, there was very little physical evidence as to whether or not I could do it, whether or not it'd be safe for me to do it, all that. Yeah, it's remarkable. Well, for all of us, there's coaches or mentors in life that were that spark plug that propelled us to do great things or possibilities or, you know, we're kind of the leading with the torch, right? In your case, yeah. it sounds like, you know, your dad certainly was, well, your dad and your mother, you know, were certainly leaders in that category, but also you had some coaches along the way that helped you, you know, pave the way. And, you know, it must have been a amazing mindset that once you got in there, and I saw some videos where you're actually, you played nose guard, so you go in and you tackle people at their knees, they go down and, you know, starting to like build that confidence that, this is possible, right? Yeah. I mean, I think upon the first play that I took, you know, it was kind of funny, like practice scrimmage game. We weren't even wearing pads yet. And, you know, I was playing nose guard. Like you mentioned, so the center, he went to go and snap up between his legs and just stood straight up, didn't know how to block me. So I used that chance to just dive under his legs and mess the quarterback up so bad. Like I said, you know, we were not, not even wearing pads yet, but I like take my helmet and rammed it in the quarterback's legs and knocked him over and first play got that sack, you know, and it was, it was such a big confidence boost, you know, and changer, just a absolute game changer for me. And I think that's why like, you know, I think a lot about like the education that comes with, with sports outside of just, you know, just kind of like the, the camaraderie aspects of things. I mean, it's, it's really, there's a deeper sort of like learning of ourselves that, that goes on with sports, you know, or goes on inside of a mountain. I think that that's, you know, a lot more of that like physical utility of it that we don't really talk about enough. We can't really quantify. Yeah, no, you're exactly right. So it's not about, well, finding your summit, right? So it's not literally about the summit. It's metaphorical. Right. And so, so many of us have different things that we're trying to achieve, but along that path, it's really not so much the destination, but it's the journey. Right. And in that journey, you know, I look back and I was fortunate to be on the winning side many times and catch the last second touchdown. And, but all the time that I spent with my teammates and in the locker room and being taught life lessons by my coaches, you know, those are the nuggets that have propelled me forward to try to accomplish these things. So I agree with what you're saying. So the thing that's cool about this too is that as it just relates for football and then we'll move on, that's so much of who I became 
because that was the path that I led. But since you were able to do that and now you're watching NFL games or college games or high school games or whatever games you're watching, you know, you can literally understand and feel what that was like because you put on the helmet and you had the shoulder pads on and, you know, you played that position and you're part of the team. It's really cool that you were able to like, you know, live through that, right? Totally. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I look back on that period of time in my life too, you know, it was really one of the harder periods that I ever had to deal with. You know, I think it was kind of becoming more self-aware about the disability and, you know, 10 years old, nine, 10 years old really was when I was beginning to ask a lot of those bigger questions and kind of what the rest of my life is going to look like, you know, and it was kind of perfect timing to be able to go in and play and, and develop that first dose of kind of finding a summit, finding a purpose, finding, you know, sort of that challenge that's going to go in and let's be in another spot. You know, I think it's so many of the lessons I talk about now, you know, if I'm giving a speech or telling my story, like, you know, in, in, in this, I think it comes back to that, you know, that first year playing football, just making that tackle and like how differently life showed up after that. Well, okay. So it sounded like what, again, I'm just going off what I read, but it sounded like you moved on, you know, the kids were getting kind of bigger and stronger and taller and everything else. And so you had to kind of rechannel. And by the way, that happens to all of us. Yeah. It's just, you know, it right. doesn't matter if you have arms, legs or what, I mean, we all grow a certain height and we all have to rechannel, you know, some are better in other sports or maybe it's, you know, some artistic endeavor that they're after playing an instrument or something. So it happens to all of us. But for you, it sounded like you went and rechanneled that towards wrestling, right? So, okay. So now you're, you're moving on from football. You're still a young kid, but now you're moving into more middle school or high school. When did you pick up the whole wrestling thing? Yeah. So it was sixth through eighth grade played football. And then it was also sixth grade. They started wrestling and then continued that on through high school. And I think the, the sort of rechanneling, you know, and refocusing me became a little bit more towards high school when I was kind of a senior year, especially kind of really zeroed in on that, you know, that goal of, of wrestling at the nationals and which I got to do. That was a pretty amazing experience. But the, yeah, I mean, it kind of just started from my dad basically tricking me into, you know, telling me it's going to be just like the pro wrestlers, you know, that I was a big fan of the Hulk Hogan's of the world and people like that, you know, and I had kind of have a completely different idea of what wrestling was inside of my head than what I was actually getting into. So I show up to practice that first day and, you know, realize like it's totally different than I was expecting, but it was fun. It was awesome. Even though that first year sucked a lot. I mean, it was, you know, I lost every single match for a year and a half and did not want to come back and continue doing it. Who pushed you to that you're coming back? It was a lot of kind of back and forth, both my parents. I mean, it was that first year they just didn't want to see me quit in the middle of the season. Yep. You know, did not want to come back and do it again that, that seventh grade season. But, you know, they kind of convinced me to. There was a period in my life where, gosh, I was probably in seventh grade, something like that, and maybe eighth grade. And, you know, I started playing football when I was fourth grade. And, you know, the first year we went out, we won the state or the city championship or we're in the we're in the city championship. We lost it. But it went from there. And I went for like three years in a row and I was kind of like the guy, right? And I was running around and a lot of touchdowns and I was running back. And then I moved up into another, you know, as you're, as you're getting older, moved into a different league and different coach. First new coach I'd been exposed to in three years. And so it was like my fourth year going into this and he benched me, right? I never saw hardly the day. He just didn't think I could play football. Right. And I was just blown away. And it was the hardest thing, but the best thing that ever happened to me. And one, one of the things kind of like you that my dad had told me back then is like, Hey, if you want to quit, you're going to quit, but you're not going to quit during the season, which is when I wanted to quit. Right. And right. so I made it through that season and, you know, I got to play a little bit at the end and then the summer came through and then I kind of forgot about it all. And then there was a new coach and I, all right, I'll go out and turn out. And, you know, I can't imagine what my life would have been like if I would have quit. Totally. So same thing with you. It is it's wild to think about. You know, I have no idea how differently things would have turned out, you know, but I know that we probably wouldn't be having this conversation right now. So let me ask you this. Were you working out with weights or, you know, in terms of you getting stronger now, we're talking about your senior year where you're really starting to excel in wrestling. How does that all work? Did you do that and how does it work? Yeah, you know, I think wrestling, I think a lot of sports are like this, but I think wrestling especially is a sport where you benefit greatly from just time on the mat, you know, and like just everybody gets better as long as you put in the work and you're on the mat, you know, kind of day in, day out. So that, that was a lot of it was just, you know, putting in the extra work. My coach, you know, in wrestling, Coach Ramos, you know, another one of those kind of amazing mentors that you mentioned, really, he would go and get down on his knees, you know, and tuck his arms into his sleeves, try to figure out moves they could go and do from kind of my, my perspective. But by the time, you know, my senior year, I'd established kind of enough of a game plan of, you know, this is how I'd go and, you know, work the takedown, what I do on top, what I do on bottom. So kind of had 
build that strategy out enough. And at that point, it was just getting stronger, you know, and it was definitely, you know, doing okay in that department. I would strap uh, chains and kind of like a cuff and chain around my arm yep. and do different kind of like a modified butterfly press that my peak did. Uh, so 120 pounds on each arm, 240, did that 23 times in one set. You know, so I was wrestling at 103 pounds, 105 pounds, you know, but then going up against guys, you know, that I was definitely had that strength advantage and then became a kind of an interesting debate beyond that of whether or not I was unfairly advantaged in the sport. That's crazy. You know, just to put that in perspective, I was very fortunate to be invited to the NFL combines, right? Back in the day. So essentially they take the top 330 players, invite them to someplace. In my day, it was Arizona State. They now do it at Indianapolis, right? Everybody convenes, the, the agents, the owners, the coaches, all these players. And one of the things you have to do is the bench press. And it's 225 pounds. And how many times can you rep that out? And right. we're talking about with you 240, 23 times. I think I did 225, you know, maybe 26 times or something. I mean, you know, I mean, that's a great feat that you pulled off. Just, you know, to put that on NFL caliber. And I was one of the stronger <laughs> ones, right? Right. At, at that combine right. in those days. So again, another just huge compliment to you. So how did it play out that senior year for you at the end of the day in terms of your wrestling? Because you mentioned, you know, maybe it was the year before or a couple years, you know, when you first started out, you lost every single match. And so mentally now you got to get over that hump and now you're starting to get some momentum. Yeah. So it was a lot of it was just tuning out that debate too of kind of, you know, like I mentioned, of whether I was unfairly advantaged or not. I mean, to me, it was like, you know, work as hard as you can, let the advantages sort of cultivate themselves, right? Like, you know, I have no problem with cultivated advantages that happen through work and being disciplined and it's kind of what happened. So cruising into that senior year, then beating a lot of other surrounding state champions, state placers, and it made a pretty huge difference going into that year. Confidence wise, you know, I ended up um, my senior year and beat most people on the medal stand in my own state, but it kind of messed up my own state tournament, but then ended up due to the performance side of that year, got invited to nationals and was one match away from being an All-American in high school. Wow. So. It's kind of a big juxtaposition from where we started. So in 2004, then, that you got the SB Best Athlete Award for a Disability. Is that right? Yep. 2004. Did you actually go to the ceremony? Did. Yeah, yeah. It was amazing. Yeah. I mean, at 18 years old, it was like, you know, just all the celebrities that are there, you know, like getting to hang out with Tom Brady, Peyton Manning, you know, all these guys. I mean, it was just, it was wild. Listen, on my bucket list, I want to go to the ESPYs. Right. I love right. that. Yeah. I love that show. And you've, you've done it twice, right? Yeah. I was going to say we did it at the end for climbing Kilimanjaro in 2012. So it was really ESPN did an awesome job putting together a story for that one. So let's talk about that. Okay. So let's go back and then we're going to jump into that. So you finish out your senior year, you know, good things are happening to you. You're getting more and more confident about, you know, this is a life of really no limits, right, for you. I mean, I know you talk about no yep. excuses. We'll get into your book here in a second, but you decide to attend the University of Georgia. How long were you there? And Because I think you got to a point where you saw your purpose better served by helping others. Is that right? Yeah. You know, a lot of it was just wild to look back on now, but there's a ton of opportunity that was coming my way in terms of getting to have the story come out more publicly, you know, after the wrestling, you know, had... HBO Real Sports do a story, number of other media outlets, had a front page story in USA Today, all that stuff, you know, an hour interview and, and Larry King. So kind of, you know, the opportunity to start speaking, to start traveling, to write a book, launch that book, all those things kind of started happening at once. And so I went from being a full-time college student studying journalism at UGA to then like full-time business traveler, 19 years old. So it was a pretty wild shift. At what point did you set your sights on your shifting you're not wrestling anymore. And now you're looking at new athletic endeavors that you can take on. And so you of all the things that you could possibly do on the planet, you say, I'm going to take on Kilimanjaro. Yeah. It's kind of, yeah, coming off of too. It's funny now. It used to be like a huge portion of what I would speak about, you know, in a big part of my life. But like, there's even like a two year build up to do an MMA fight, all this stuff kind of leading up to that. There's always been that connection to like a physical thing or challenge for me. I think because it's the easiest access, I think to like, a, you know, having like a really deeper experience. You know, and but yeah, the Kilimanjaro thing came about after doing a CrossFit competition. I opened a CrossFit gym in Atlanta. One of the early competitions that we had, you had to do a thousand meter row on a rowing machine and then sprint up uh, Stone Mountain, this little like 900 foot granite rock in, in Atlanta. And I tore up all the skin on my arms doing it. He used leather welding sleeves to kind of protect my arms and my feet and, you know, tore my pants up and they got to the top and I was like, man, this is beautiful. Told my friend that night that I wanted to do Kilimanjaro, and she said, "You're freaking crazy with a different, <laughs> different F word." Uh, yeah, <laughs> like it's 
you know, that's kind of true. It's kind of how it happened. It was like, yeah, I know this is nuts, but we can figure this out. Well, let's go back to where we started. Let's go back to, I'm at 21,000 feet and here you come, you know, crawling past me and I'm sitting there in a rock. I'm like, okay, if he's going, (laughs) there's no way I'm not going, you know, like that inspired me to get off my ass and start climbing again. But what I saw is you had some kind of, they almost look like tire treads or something that you had strapped to your arms and legs that enabled you to like motor up, you know, this crazy mountain. You know, there's a better explanation for that, but that's what I saw. They look like you know tire treads, right? Well, it's funny. The prototype that we created was like literally tire treads, but the gear that I was using there when you saw me was we'd taken uh, like carbon fiber, made kind of a carbon fiber cast around my arms and my feet. And then there's like a Vibram, like a hiking shoe sole, like attached to that. Okay. So yeah, there was kind of it's actual like shoe sole that's attached to the to the gear now. But when we started, you know, it was taking bath towels and duct tape and duct taping the bath towels on my arms and wow. taking the bike tires and cutting those into squares, you know, kind of create some traction. So yeah, it's exactly well, how we started. Yeah, and both those mountains, and I've done Kilimanjaro twice now. I was down there last February with Chris Long of the Eagles. Now, he was with the Patriots last year, and there was like six ex-NFL guys. We were doing a fundraiser for Waterboys, which is a building water wells for the people of the Maasai tribe. But we also had four Marines. Some of them were, were Green Berets, but uh, two of them were amputees. And Christy Ennis is somebody who's on that, uh, and she became the first above the knee amputee to, and she basically hopped up to the top. It was crazy. It was insane. Wow. And the amount of grit that she put together to do that was insane. So when we did this, even though it was slower on actual summit day, because you're going straight up, you know, from your standpoint, you know, as you know, it's incredibly rocky. It's almost like you're on the moon or something, you know, through a lot of that trek, you know, to get yourself kind of in position to, to, to make that summit bid. And how many days did it take you to do the whole thing? Kilimanjaro is 10 10- to the summit, Aconcagua, I think it was our 17th day. That's amazing. And just to put that in perspective, the rest of us did Kilimanjaro this last year. I think we did it in six days. So, and we're, you know, hiking, walking, and you're crawling. So it's just a whole different, you know, whole different right. thing, right? So it's crazy. So ESPN, they did a piece on you when you went down there? Yeah, we so did a, you know, kind of a, a deal with them beforehand, which is reassuring that, you know, somebody was going to get behind kind of sharing the story. And we wanted to have kind of bigger, bigger message to the message being in particular to the veteran community, you know, that you kind of alluded to. We really were struck by, you know, at the time, I think it was 18 or so veterans a day that were committing suicide, you know, then now those numbers have creeped all the way up to 22, 23 in recent years. And I wanted to be able to go and show that like, hey, I don't know what it's like to lose an arm or a leg or, or both, but I do know what it's like to live without, you know, and I know that it's we're, we're all fully capable of, of living an extraordinary life, regardless of, you know, the circumstances or sort of passing conditions that happen to us. But effectively, yeah, it was, you know, I mean, the ESPN thing was kind of that basically they were going to give us like a some portion of the budget for the climb kind of, you know, ahead of time. And that was kind of enough to be able to go and put us over the edge to be able to have enough to go and take the chance to do it. Knowing though that too, if we didn't come back with like a compelling story, you know, if we didn't come back with, you know, something that they're going to use, then we wouldn't see anything beyond that. But it really was enough of us like seed money to go and take this group. You know, when I'm hiking, when I'm going, it's a different pace. It's a whole different kind of expedition, you know, and it sometimes it ends up being pricier and, and all those things. Got to figure out those details. So it's just like wrestling. I think, you know, a huge part of mountaineering, the fight is like leading up to get to the climb to get to the event you know in wrestling it's you know you're cutting weight you're miserable you're training you're hurt but then just to get to that event like that's the buy-in that everybody has to make did you struggle with altitude sickness on kilimanjaro or aconcagua definitely struggled (laughs) yeah for sure. I don't know anybody that does it just completely effortlessly. But the hardest parts, I would say, were Kilimanjaro is just really long. Yep. You know, so. Well, so was just, Aconcagua. That's a long way. Yep. Aconcagua is as well, but it's it's different. You know, we also took our time and kind of spaced it out a lot better. You know, took a much smaller group so we could go and take our time. You know, if we needed potentially 25 days instead of 17, we would have been prepared for that. That was a big factor. But Aconcagua, too, the, the terrain. You know, just like the loose rock and the scree, that was the most maddening part, you know, because I, like most people could, you know, you can use your trekking poles to kind of stab into the rock and take yep. a big step. For me, it's not going to happen. So, you know, just sometimes we'd be sliding back, move up four or five feet and then like just fight to get to the top of that and then slide six feet down. <laughs> it was 
that was kind of nonstop on Aconcagua. Has there any been any, any consideration for you to put prosthetics you know, on your legs or your arms? How do you feel about that? I used to use them when I was a kid, and um, they kind of almost slowed me down a lot more than they helped. So kind of the technology's gotten way better. But, you know, oddly enough, even the way my hips are shaped, it's almost better and conducive to bear crawling. Hmm. So I'm going to ask a really ignorant question because I, yeah, don't, I don't I don't know the answer. How do you drive? <laughs> so just grab the steering wheel with my arms. Yeah, and I've lifted pedals. So like a extension that comes up to the, from the brake, and I hit it with my left foot, and then an extension that comes up on the right side for the gas. They I hit with the other foot. So it's a, like a custom car. So it's not a yeah. But you can pop in my car and drive it. You know, you just like put your legs underneath the pedals, and you'd be good to go. Yeah, that's awesome. What was it like to be on Oprah? <laughs> it was pretty wild. The coolest part of that whole thing, I think, was watching my sisters, though. You know, they're with me and, you know, they're huge Oprah fans and you know, having Oprah sit next to my baby sister, Mackenzie, and compliment her on her shoes, you know, and seeing my sister, like, light up, like, you know, she was that, like, just Oprah complimented her shoes. It was the biggest deal ever. That was really cool. She seems like she's the exact same person you see on TV, very warm, engaging, present person that you see there as you probably get you know, on TV, right? I mean, both sides of it. You know, then I also, I think, you know, over, over the years too, you know, even in the event that you go and hear stories about people and how they act certain times, whatever, I try to not take any one thing, like in particular, and kind of look at more of like the kind of aggregate whole, you know, of how somebody's reputation is. But, you know, with someone like Oprah, for instance, what I didn't realize is that when she was taping, she would tape three shows in a day, mm. you know, and like there does have to be kind of like a strict calculated precision, you know, of kind of marching orders from like one guest to the next and all of that, you know, and having a system down. If you're going to do three shows in a day in front of a live, completely different live studio audience each time, that's a lot. Yeah. So I started these podcasts, I don't know, three, four months ago, and they've just taken off. And I'm so, you know, grateful for that. And I've tried to do two back to back and and one day, and they're just too draining for me. You know, by the time I do all this research and, you know, I get really into the moment of talking to people like you and, you know, what you've been able to accomplish. It's just, it's a lot. So, you know, for her to do three, and that's why she's Oprah, right? And I'm where I'm at, but you know, it's all good. So it's certainly a talent that she has and had. That's why she's popular and everybody loves her, right? Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about your book. So is this right? It's the true story of a congenital amputee who became a champion in wrestling and in life. No excuses. Is that kind of your tagline? Say, yeah. I mean, it's fit well. I got it. My gym, no excuses, you know, the book. Yeah, it's pretty core to my central philosophies, I think. You know, it's funny, though, too, the book, I think, was an amazing reflection of where I was at at 19 years old. But, you know, it's also something that came out when I was 19. I'm 31 now. So, you know, as human beings, we aren't really like, you know, the snapshot of who we are in time there is not always who we're going to be. I mean, that would be born. Right. So it's funny that like, I don't know, it's definitely time for another book, but got to not make excuses myself to get out there and and write it. Right. (laughs) Well, yeah, I've been trying to figure out how to write a book and I've talked to many other people who have done books. And so I'm kind of like, you know, going down the certain path and I would love to do that. And, you know, I just need to take that same attitude, no excuses and go make it happen. But one thing that you said, which is interesting, and I do agree with you, is when we're talking about, you know, finding your summit, there isn't just one summit, right? And you're right in that, you know, when I was in my 20s, I was trying to play in the NFL in college, and that was my summit at the time. That's what I was trying to to, to accomplish. And then in my 30s, I started, you know, my businesses, and I got married, and I had kids, and 40s. So every one of those decades, it has seemed like there's been a different period where I'm trying to get to a certain point. And now, you know, I'm in this whole nether where metaphorical point of finding your summit actually is me (laughs) climbing mountains and trying to accomplish that, right? And what you have to go through and all the preparation you have to make to make those things happen. But, you know, I love that. So when do you think this next book will be coming? Have you started that or is this kind of just in your head and you know you should do it? I'd say right now, I've started a little bit, but my main focus right now is video. You know, video and film photography. It's kind of like my next, you know, big mountain to focus on. You know, really the, it's been, you know, sort of a creative outlet that I've had a freaking blast doing. So hopefully going to be doing more and more of that, you know, and just quintupling down on video and, and trying to go and connect and build you know, deeper audience with people through that. So when you talk about video, tell me exactly what you're talking about. Like three minute, one to three minute, like how to's or what are you thinking? Yeah, more kind of um, like not like a full blown vlog style kind of video, but you know, something a little bit more kind of personal, intimate, not just caught up in, you know, making it 
overly produced or motivational and blah, 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 kind of just more authentic, give people kind of a glimpse and different things. But, you know, just running around, learning how to go and shoot with, you know, I've got like a Sony camera system set up right now, but, you know, just all that stuff, editing stuff together, color grading, it's a different world. What is on the horizon for you athletically? you have another mountain in the future or what are you thinking? Yeah, I've got a few for sure. You know, and obviously, as you know, like the seven summits and all that, like there's, you know, those kind of big trips are, you know, they're kind of few and far between, right? Like there's a bunch of other, you know, sort of smaller, different experiences that I want to take on. For instance, you know, I'm not really sure whether we do it here in the continental US or somewhere else, but one of my buddies is finishing up around 10, 11 years with the SEAL teams on the East Coast, and he wants to see if he can bear crawl a mountain with me. Mm, that's so, awesome. You know, I need to... <laughs> uh, let me give you one that you 100% should do, and you, it'd be your third mountain, yeah. you know, of the seven, and that's Mount Kosciuszko down in Australia. Yeah. Yeah, that would right, be like a day or two, you know, for you, yeah. maybe three. It's very attainable, and it's the terrain compared to those other two mountains or is yeah. 100% better yeah. and beautiful. And there's a certain path you want to go, which I could tell you more about. But I mean, the people in Australia are so warm and friendly. And as I said, if you've done those other, t- I mean, it, it's like 100% slam dunk. You could do this one. That'd, that'd be awesome. Yeah. yeah it's definitely for sure. Yeah, no, that's great. Okay, well, where can people find you? I would say, you know, easiest bet would be Facebook, Instagram, things like that. You know, online, I've kind of gone dark on social media the last little bit just because I have been so focused on video stuff. So hopefully you can find me there as well in the not too distant future. So Okay. We will 100% put like all your channels on our show notes and so people can find those things. Great. I do want to end by saying that, you know, we had our little chat at 21,000 feet somewhere, right? I was on the rock. You were actually climbing. And then we had another great chat. You were there with your crew, right? It was at that lower camp. We had summited and now you had summited and now we're at, I can't remember what, you know, 16,000 feet or something. Right. Gone down. And remember you guys were hanging out at your tent and, you know, I came over and we had a great chat for an hour or so. And again, I was just blown away by you, your optimism. And the other part of that too, as you know, I mentioned it takes a village and in this case it takes a team and you just, the other guys that were climbing with you, I think there was three other guys, right? That helped you with this. And those guys were rock stars too. But yeah. Oh, Oh. absolutely. Yeah. We had uh, three Americans other than me, four total and then two Argentinians. Yeah. So Guillermo and Nani. Yeah. They're all those. Right. They were just great. And, you know, I mean, I've been on five of the mountains and, you know, I wouldn't have been able to do what I've done without the proper guides and other teammates. And it just seemed like the guys that you had there, everybody was super cool. Everybody was super committed to your cause and just seem like the type of guys you want to hang out with and have a beer. And it's usually kind of a litmus test for, I would say, any endeavor. I heard it as advice given by a friend, Tim Ferriss. He said, you know, if you're going to do business with anybody, make sure they're the type of person that you'd want to get a beer with, you know, but if you're going to climb a mountain with somebody, I think that that statement times a thousand. Yeah, it's your life, <laughs> it's right? You're doing. It's, yeah, it's your life and, you know, you're going to be spending a lot of time with that, with those people. So you better enjoy it. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Well, listen, it has been an absolute joy to have you on my pod, finding your summit. And certainly you've just had a long list of amazing accomplishments. And it just seems like we share a kindred spirit a little bit. I literally feel like I haven't done anything. And like my (laughs) stuff's all out in the front, right? Like I've got so many things that I want to do and accomplish. And you're just so forward thinking. And you're not thinking about, you know, poor me because I don't have this or that. You're just like, look at all the opportunities that I have. And you're, you're imparting that knowledge of no excuses, you know, to the planet. And, you know, I think that I know I'm a better person because I know you and know other people have benefited from your spirit and your inspiration about the things that you want to get get accomplished. So thank you. I love it. And I love the vibe that you're spreading out to the world too. You know, it's like we can all kind of do that in our own unique way. Awesome. Listen, have a great day and I can't wait to continue to follow your journey. Okay. Awesome. Likewise, man. All right, buddy. Talk soon. Hey, this is Mark and thank you so much for tuning in to the podcast this week. We had another great guest, and it is so awesome to continually have these different people on, talk about their different adversity, how they've overcome that, um, and what they've done to affect change in their life to become very successful. So, you know, really appreciate you guys uh, tuning in. So, uh, as always, we love the rating and reviews that you guys do on iTunes. If you haven't done that, please go do that. It really helps us in terms of uh, increasing our visibility within uh, Apple iTunes. 
And um, anyways, it's just fun to share the love and uh, what these different stories, these different people are, are all about. So make sure you tune in next week. We appreciate it. And that's it. Bye.